Hello there, misfits. This is Kate. And this is Matt. Welcome to Horrorwood. Hello, hello. Hello. I'm back. I'm back. Good to see you. It's nice to be seen. Saw you five minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> Even though none of the listeners can see you, but I can see you. There you are. Wow. Uh, before um, we... Oh, go ahead. No, I have nothing to mention. <laughs> okay. I'm just going to say happy to be here. Uh, before we get started, I, I want to give a, an update on Kale because I know people are like, what happened to Kale? Is she off the podcast? Like, Is she coming back? What's going on? She's just on a break, you guys. Her job is a little crazy right now. Um, If you've been listening from the beginning, then you know she's a teacher. School year is wrapping up and teachers everywhere are losing their minds. So she's kind of in that state right now. Uh, But we've been texting and she'll be back. She's she's not injured to Kale's mom. She's fine. And uh, (laughs) yeah, we'll welcome her back when she's ready. And in the meantime, you've got me. Yes, unfortunately. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Just kidding. I love you. And I want to shout out our latest Patreon member, Lizzie Bracken. Woo! Woo! She uh, decided to be a misfit murderino. So she's getting the bonus episodes and the ad free stuff and all the good stuff. Thank you, Lizzie. We love you. And we love all of our Patreons. Thank you, Lizzie. And uh, just a reminder I think I mentioned in the last episode, but. We've added a new tier to the Patreon regime, that's not right, that is a little bit cheaper than what we currently had going. So we have the, we still have the $5 Murderino tier, and with that you get all the bonus episodes. But if you're like, I just want to support and maybe like not have to listen to ads, but I'm not quite ready to pay five a month, you can pay two dollars a month two little buckaroos two dollars two dollars that's a steal and you can be one of our accomplices so head on over to patreon patreon.com slash horrorwood podcast and check that out and meanwhile don't forget to rate us review us we love it we need it it's what all the algorithms go by you know about the algorithms everybody knows an algorithm and it really helps us out a lot. How are you doing, Matt? How's life? Uh, I'm doing great. Since uh, I saw you last, uh, Frankie <laughs> was biting my hand. Uh, she's uh-huh. very wound up today. and She is. She's wild. Uh, and she needs a break. She needs a nap. She did not get a nap today. And I think she's just uh, uh, a bundle of trouble right now. Yeah. I don't know why she won't sleep. Meanwhile, <laughs> meanwhile, we finished jury duty. Amazing. So good. Congrats to all involved. Best show on TV. If you are not watching jury duty, then after this podcast, you need to go to Amazon. I think it's on Amazon, but it's also on Freevee, which is just like a little free app that you can download. And you need to watch jury duty. It is the most amazing show. How they pulled that off is pretty remarkable. It's basically, Matt, do you want to give the setup? It's a TV show where the the central character is a real person and everyone around them uh, are actors. And he's unaware of that. Uh, he's been called to jury duty and he doesn't know that it's a complete setup. And everyone from the judge to the bailiff to the other jurors are all in on it and are all actors. Um, it's amazing. It, it's amazing. It's um. James it's, Marsden it's, is in it. James Marsden plays himself. I don't want to give so away good. too much more, but it's it's uh Yeah, that's enough. Kind of, that's enough. Kind of an amazing uh experiment that goes about as right as it possibly could. It's it's documentary style, kind of like The Office, and it is fantastic. Highly recommended. I feel like I've procrastinated long enough. I really don't want to start talking about this case. Yeah, you you seem like you're you're hesitant to jump into this one. 
This one is a really rough one. So I am going to give a content warning. Uh, It involves a child and it involves domestic abuse. So if you don't want to hear about those things, skip this one. We'll have another one for you. Putting that warning out there, I probably won't mention it again, but I might. Who knows? Uh, It's really, really tragic and rough. And I can hear our dog wailing right now. (laughs) She's upset about it. Do you want to pause for a second? Yeah. Unpig. All right. I feel like we should explain unpig in case I decide to keep that in. (laughs) (laughs) So we play Wordle every morning. And uh, Kate is very, very good at Wordle. You've been I, killing I'm, it lately, though. Well, I've been on a streak. I've been on a roll. But you generally uh, crush it uh, and and have it way before I do. But I was working on it one day. I'd forgotten to do it in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> and somehow I, was, I had arrived at trying the word unpig, which is not a word. But we've made it one. I tried it nonetheless. We've made it one. And now we'll just walk around the house and point to each other and say unpig like if we're taking a nap and then suddenly we wake up it's like unpig no (laughs) no one cares (laughs) this is why you and i have to stay together because no one else wants this unpig okay all right well we had to take a little frankie break because she's going crazy but now we are going to get into this today we are talking about child star judith barcy do you know that name matt I don't. I don't know anything about her. Some people might not recognize the name, but once they hear her work, they're like, oh, yeah. So Judith was one of the most adorable kids on the planet to ever grace the screen. Although she appeared in numerous films and TV shows and commercials, it's her work as a voice actor that she's most recognized for. She voiced the role of Ducky in The Land Before Time and Anne-Marie in All Dogs Go to Heaven. Oh, man. I haven't seen either of those two movies. What? (laughs) I know. I haven't seen either of those two movies. I mean, you are a few years older because they came out in the 80s, and you were probably like a little bit older than that. I remember them coming out. Yeah, I I remember them coming out. I think I just missed them. Wow. I remember seeing them. Oh, my God. All Dogs Go to Heaven. I bawled my eyes out. Okay, but a lot of people will recognize her work from that. She's got a pretty famous line in The Land Before Time that's quoted. Judith Eva Barcy was born on June 6, 1978 in Los Angeles, California. Her parents, Joseph and Maria Barcy, were not originally from the United States. They were both from Hungary. Maria grew up in what was considered a quote-unquote good neighborhood. But unfortunately, her father was an alcoholic, and he physically and psychologically abused Maria. Oof. Joseph grew up in what was considered a rougher industrial area, and it doesn't sound like his childhood was any better. He was miserable as a kid. His father abandoned the family, and Joseph never got to know him. And this led to him hating his mother. Because Joseph blamed his mom for allowing his father to leave. Uh. So that was what was going on in his child brain was, oh, mom let him go. Yeah. He would tell his friends he didn't have a dad or a mom. And in Hungary, family was everything. Families stayed together. There was a huge stigma around, quote unquote, broken homes. Uh Uh-huh. Joseph was also an outcast at school, which he claimed was partly due to his illegitimacy because of the stigma surrounding that, and partly due to his heavy Hungarian accent. Now, I've never been to Hungary, and I don't know much about the country, but I would think a lot of Hungarians would have Hungarian accents. (laughs) One would think that? I don't know. Maybe there's... Some regional differences, I'm sure, but uh, that's that was his claim. That was his he he was had very low self esteem about it. He was extremely ashamed of his accent, and this would follow him throughout his entire life. He attributed his thick accent to not knowing who his father was, which seems like a stretch. And since he blamed his mom for not knowing who his father was, in his mind. 
every problem he had was because of his mother. So women were the root of all evil, obviously, which led him to view all women as whores. So there's a lot to unpack there. Yeah. Wow. There's a lot to unpack there. Yeah. Maria and Joseph did not know each other in Hungary. They wouldn't meet until years later. During the 1956 Soviet occupation of Hungary, thousands were killed or wounded, and 250,000 fled the country. This included Maria and Joseph. Maria went to the United States, and Joseph went to France. While on the train to France, he met a woman named Clara. The two quickly became an item and were wed. They had two children, a son in 1957 named Barna, and a daughter in 1958 named Agnes, but they called her Augie. The family eventually moved to the United States and stayed in New York, but unfortunately, things turned dark when Joseph began abusing Clara and the children. Uh Uh-oh. Joseph was an alcoholic, and he was an angry drunk. He would throw pots and pans at his wife and the kids. And he would constantly threaten to burn down the house or kill them all. Wow. I cannot fathom that, living in a house with that much tension and aggression on a daily basis. I mean, that's terrifying. Yeah. Clara wanted a divorce, but Joseph told her if she filed for divorce, he would kill her and their two children. To him, the family unit was everything. Even though this was an extremely dysfunctional family unit, But appearances really mattered to Joe, and divorce was out of the question. Eventually, though, Clara had had enough, and in 1969, so they were together for several years, Yeah, she packed up herself and the kids and fled to Arizona. However, Joseph followed the family to Arizona in the hopes of reconciling. He managed to charm Clara, he stopped drinking, and he found work as a plumber, and things did get a little better. For a short amount of time. In less than a year, Joseph was back to his abusive ways and at one point threw a cast iron skillet at Clara. Oh my God. What? That was the final straw for her. I mean, you could kill someone with that. Yeah. She filed for divorce and left him. She needed to get herself and the kids out of that situation. Yeah, get out. In an attempt to start fresh, Joseph relocated to Los Angeles. He freelanced working odd contracting jobs here and there and was given the nickname Arizona Joe since he'd just come from there. Meanwhile, Maria had settled down in Los Angeles. She was enamored with the glamorous Hollywood life and dreamed of becoming an actress. However, I couldn't find any evidence that she was actually working to pursue an acting career. I think she Uh kind of just wanted it to happen. I don't think she knew how to make that happen. Yeah. She worked as a waitress at a restaurant that was a popular meeting place for immigrants and was also immigrant-owned. Like Joseph, she had been married before, though not much is known about that relationship. Unlike Joseph, she did not have any kids of her own, but she dreamed of having a family. That dream would start to take shape when, in 1976, Joseph walked into the restaurant where Maria worked. Maria thought he was very handsome. She told a friend he looked like Mario Lanza, who was a popular opera singer and film star in the 1940s and 50s. I looked up his picture, and the two men do look very similar. And Maria was into it. (laughs) Yeah. Joseph had sort of a big man on campus attitude. He could be charming. He would pay for his and his friends' drinks with $100 bills, which did not go unnoticed by Maria. She was like, ooh, who's this guy? Yeah, good way to get some attention. The two hit it off and began dating. In August of 1977, they were married and got pregnant pretty much right away. Judith, or Judy, as her loved ones called her, was born the following June, and she was the apple of Maria's eye. Maria quit working to become a stay-at-home mom, while Joseph's plan was to be the breadwinner. However, Joseph had trouble finding employment. He didn't have a steady income. So the family really struggled. They were living in a small apartment and were on welfare. But Maria was optimistic. She had big dreams. Mm -hmm. She thought that even though she didn't make it as an actress, her daughter could. 
and that became her mission. Oh. Yeah, it's it's controversial. Yeah. Um starting to get those stage mom vibes. She very much was a stage mom. Not like a rude, aggressive one, but she devoted her life to Judith's career. So when Judith was just a toddler, Maria started giving her lessons in poise and speaking. And she was like two years old. Get him in those pageants. Start them young. Oh, that's horrible. I don't think she did pageants. Maria's brother, Joseph. Yes, he's also a Joseph, so not to be confused. Yeah, there's a lot of Josephs in this story. Mm, just two. Who had also immigrated from Hungary and was living in New York, told Maria she was wasting her time. He was like, mm, yeah, I don't know about that. The odds are against you. And Maria was like, never tell me the odds. Because it's Star <laughs> Wars week this week. I had to yeah, put it in. Did you like Star it? Wars. Yeah, I did. Yeah, Thank you. appropriate. Maria was determined to make Judith successful. And it is a controversial topic because obviously Judith was not old enough to understand that she didn't have to pursue an acting career. She didn't have a say in the matter, really, at least not at the age of two when her mom began giving her these lessons. We were just talking yeah. about this yesterday about Macaulay Culkin. Yeah. yeah, Macaulay Culkin was talking about that on a podcast about how he really had no choice. His parents signed him up. He... He was given scripts, he was told what to do, but he really had no choice in what he was doing. And you said that he didn't even necessarily know what the movie was about. Yeah, he didn't even know. He didn't even read the full scripts. Like he wasn't even given the full script to read. He kind of knew what happened in some of the stories, mm -hmm. uh, some of the movies overall, but like he didn't know his dialogue before he showed up on that day. <laughs> yeah, and, a and especially with little kids who don't know how to read yet, they're just told, say this line like this. And yep. that's how they act. But one day in 1983, when Judith was five years old, Maria took her to an ice skating rink. There just so happened to be a production crew there that day shooting a commercial. And one of the casting associates spotted Judith ice skating and thought she was absolutely adorable because she was. She had a great look, as they say. So she approached Judith and her mom to see if there was any interest in Judith getting into commercials. The casting associate thought Judith was three years old because she was so tiny. She was really small for her age. So to find out she was five made her all the more appealing as a child actor because that's a huge jump, developmentally speaking. Yeah. Also, just from a production standpoint, too, it means you can be on set for a much longer amount of time, which makes a huge difference. Yes. A five-year-old is going to have a better understanding of what to do on a set than a three-year-old. It, it's just helpful to have an older kid who can play younger. Of course, Maria was ecstatic. This was everything she'd hoped for for Judith. Later that year, Judith appeared in her first commercial, commercial which was for Donald Duck Orange Juice. And she got a meeting with Harry Gold and Associates Talent Agency. They signed her on the spot. Fun fact, Harry Gold is the father of Tracy Gold, who played Carol Seaver on Growing Pains. Oh, wow. How about that? The Golds are going to play a big role in this episode. Numerous commercials followed. One of them was for Campbell's tomato soup, and she had to eat soup for each take. They did so many takes that she never ate tomato soup again. <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's a tough one because soup, most of the time, if you're doing a commercial and you have to take a bite of something, mm -hmm. they have a bucket. And, you know, a lot of actors are pretty cavalier when they come into those shoots. It's like, oh, no, it'll be fine. I'll take a bite every time. I'll eat it. It's fine. After about three takes, it's like, no, you're using the bucket pretty, <laughs> pretty much without any, any uh, hesitation. Yeah, you're spitting that out. It gets gross pretty quick. But soup, I don't think you can really spit that out as easily. You're probably just e actually eating a lot of the soup. So the following year, Judith got her first television role. It was a miniseries called Fatal Vision, and Judith played the character of Kimberly, aged three. Brandy Gold, the sister of Tracy Gold, played the character of Kimberly, aged five. So another Gold family connection there. Mm -hmm. After Fatal Vision aired, offers started pouring in. Over the next two years, Judith was in Knott's Landing, The Twilight Zone, The Fall Guy, Remington Steel, Punky Brewster, Cheers, Cagney and Lacey, The Love Boat. That's just a few. These were huge shows. Wow, yes, absolutely. Those are like all the hits. Yeah. She was working constantly. According to an article in the LA Times, by 1985, so just two years after she was discovered at that ice skating rink, Judith was earning a hundred grand a year. 
Today, that's the equivalent of about $280,000. So over a quarter of a million dollars. And she was seven. Yeah, that's pretty solid. But not bad. Her income allowed the family to move out of that small apartment and into a house in the Canoga Park, West Hills area, which is a neighborhood in L.A. It's in the valley. And you would think that her parents, who didn't have it easy growing up, would be thrilled at their daughter's success. They were all moving up in life. And Maria was thrilled. But not Joseph. Here's this man who is the, quote, head of the household. He's going to be the breadwinner. And his little girl is making more money than he is. Meanwhile, he couldn't find a steady job. So he's feeling this pressure like he's not pulling his weight. And this causes him to start drinking more and more. Yep. In just one year, he was arrested not once, not twice, but three times for drunk driving. Ooh. And we've already seen how Joseph acts when he's been drinking. It's not good. He began to pick fights with Maria. And friends of the couple said that when they fought, Maria would bring up his past and use it against him, calling him a bastard. And for Joseph, that was the worst insult. He had so much shame about his family growing up and had such low self-esteem that being called a bastard didn't exactly smooth things over between the two. Yeah. Joseph became physically violent with Maria. He would hit her. He would try to choke her. He had a quick temper. At work, a fellow plumber by the name of Peter Kivlin said that if Joseph thought someone was making fun of him behind his back about his accent, he was really self-conscious about his accent, he would just go off. He'd pick up a two-by-four like he was going to hit somebody with it. And Peter said, quote, not that he'd go after anybody who didn't deserve it, because apparently he thinks some people do deserve to be hit by a two-by-four, <laughs> I guess. That's a weird thing to say. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this accent is so interesting to me, like why that was such a hang up for him. And I couldn't find I... him speaking on any news report or anything uh -huh. to hear it. And again, I would think that he would have grown up with a lot of people that had a strong accent. I don't know. But yeah, it was a real sticking point for him. I mean, it almost makes me think that it wasn't an accent like that level of awareness about it makes me think like was there like a speech impediment as well as the accent that could have made it even more oh very possible I, it just makes me think like an accent alone isn't enough for that level of i think anxiety and uh distress that it seemed to cause him yeah maybe there was more to that or some traumatic incident linked to his speech, you know, mm -hmm. being bullied for it or something that could have impressed at a young age. But it's a fascinating part of this to me. Joseph was a real braggadocio. He wanted people to think he was all big and bad. He told Peter that he got into a fight one time that left him blind in one eye. And he also said that he served time in prison in New York for killing a man in a fight. There is no record of him ever being arrested for that. His only criminal record were the three DUIs. Huh. When they bought their house, the first thing Joseph did was put up a spiked fence all around the property. None of the other houses in the neighborhood had a fence around them. It wasn't an unsafe neighborhood. They lived on a quiet cul-de-sac. But he had a lot of paranoia. There's a lot going on there mentally, I think. Mm -hmm. And the only way he knew how to deal with it was through alcohol. As Judith became more and more successful, Joseph grew more jealous. I think he was probably feeling inferior because of his financial situation. And sadly, he would take his feelings of insecurity out on little Judith. One day, Judith was playing out in the yard and Joseph was out there with her and Maria came home. She had a kite that she had gotten to give to Judith. But just as she handed it to her, Joseph grabbed it from her and Judith said, be careful, you're going to break it. And this grown ass man, her father, looked at Maria, his wife, and said, ugh. You see that? She's a spoiled brat who doesn't want to share. And then he broke the kite into tiny pieces. My God, what a dick. So much going on there. First off, doesn't want to share. She just shared her income and bought you a whole ass house, dude. Yeah. And why do you want to play with a little girl's toy kite anyway? The fact that he broke it, he was like, well, if you won't let me play with it, then no one gets to. Yeah, then no one gets it. This turns out to be a theme in his life, as we'll see. Meanwhile, as he's floating from one odd job to the next, Maria is on set with Judith all the time. 
and she's meeting other people in the industry and making friends with other stage moms. And one of these moms was Sherry Barber. She had a daughter just a year older than Judith. Her daughter is Andrea Barber, a.k.a. Kimmy Gibbler from Full House. Yeah. Yeah, for Kimmy Gibbler. (laughs) I know Kimmy Gibbler. That's one I know. In 1985, the two girls played sisters in a TV movie called Do You Remember Love? And they shared a trailer. So Maria and Judith had one side and Sherry and Andrea had the other. The trailer had an accordion style partition that separated the two sides. And after lunch, they'd close the partition so Judith and Andrea could rest before they had to be back on set. And Judith and her mom would take turns reading from a book and Sherry could hear them through the partition and said their voices were just so soft and sweet and animated. But it wasn't long before Judith just wanted to play with Andrea. Judith would call out to her and start telling knock-knock jokes and riddles. And they would giggle and start <laughs> and start passing notes to each other underneath the partition. So Judith passed Andrea a piece of paper. And on it, she drew a bird and some flowers and some hearts. And she wrote, I like you, Andrea. Aww. And Andrea wrote back, I like you too. So cute. Aww. So then Sherry passed Maria a note that said, I think you're a good mother. And Maria didn't write back, but when they were outside, she just turned to Sherry and said, thank you. I'm surprised she didn't write back. (laughs) It's interesting. Maria really, she seemed like she was pretty reserved and probably didn't want to partake in what she might have considered to be a childish game. Yeah. That's the only way I see that. She wasn't impolite, but it just wasn't her demeanor to to pass notes, I guess. Mm -hmm. One day, Joseph came by the set. Maria had left something at home that she needed, and he came to drop it off. And when he was there, he demanded that Judith come out and greet him. And it wasn't like, oh, how's my baby doing? Is she having fun? Does she have a minute? Can I see her? It was just, tell Judith to get out here. After he left, all Maria said to Sherry was, when he was young, he looked like Mario Lanza. And then his name didn't come up again in their conversations for another three years. Oh, wow. Wow. Despite the trouble brewing at home, no one on set sensed anything was awry. Judith always had a good attitude when it came to her work. Because kids that are being abused don't talk about it when they are out in public. Yeah, yeah. So no one knew that had interactions with Judith what was going on. And it's hard to say if acting is even what she wanted to be doing or if she did it because her mom said, you're doing this. But she didn't complain about it. She always showed up to set really happy and bubbly. So overall, it seemed like she did genuinely enjoy being there. And if she was good, I mean, obviously she gets attention and she gets reinforcement for that. So it, it probably is the safest place that she knew. She gets out of the house. Yeah. Whenever one of her TV appearances aired, Maria would make it an event. She'd pop popcorn. They'd sit together and watch. But... Maria definitely seemed more excited about it than Judith was. Judith was like, yeah, huh, that's cool. But really, she just wanted to be playing with her toys. Like many kids that grew up in the 80s, she loved the Smurfs and Care Bears. She loved riding her bike. Her favorite shows were Alf, Growing Pains, Who's the Boss, and Win, Lose, or Draw, which just made me giggle. (laughs) The classics. The classics. It's not the first show I think of when I think of shows a seven-year-old would like. (laughs) Her favorite colors were pink and purple. She liked climbing trees with her best friend, Trixie, and she'd go over to her friend Lisa's house to swim in their pool. She had five cats. That is a lot of cats. She was like a teeny tiny cat lady. And she was learning to knit. So she's kind of like a little grandma almost. Yeah. She loved sunflowers and riding her bike in the neighborhood and playing that game Operation. Like she just, those were regular things that she liked to do. And she also loved being in school. Her friend, a classmate named Lisa Williams, said that Judith didn't like having to miss school so much because she missed her friends. And she liked being there. Her favorite subjects were art and social studies, but she hated math and PE. At lunch, Maria would come to the school to bring her a hot meal almost every day that she was there. And they were usually Hungarian dishes, which Judith loved, especially duck. But she also liked mac and cheese. So, you know, balance. Uh Judith was rarely seen without Maria. On the one hand, it's like, oh, that's nice. She got a home-cooked meal every day for lunch. No Lunchables for this girl. That's what was in my lunchbox at school. Yeah, we didn't have Lunchables. Wait, you didn't have Lunchables? Well, I mean, we never... 
we never had Lunchables as like a lunch thing. Were you too high and mighty for that? No, my mom just like would always make our sandwiches and we, we just weren't like a Lunchables household. Okay. Someone was rich. But I wanted them. I mean, I wanted them. I Everybody had them. I wanted them, but we didn't have Lunchables very much. Our, our big splurge was like getting a hostess pie. If you got like one of those oh. fruit pies, that was, that was a big deal. Pretty much all throughout the 80s and 90s, I was running on Lunchables and Jello pudding cups and Ecto coolers. <laughs> that was my well-rounded diet. That's a nutritious and delicious trio. <laughs> it is. Hey, Lunchables, want to sponsor us? But <laughs> on the other hand, it seems maybe a bit much if your mom is coming to school every day to give you a meal. I don't know. Maybe it's not weird as young as she was. I don't know. I don't have kids. I'm talking out of my ass. But I mean, if your kid is the meal ticket, which is the situation, like, yeah, I think you feel like you might be helping earn that money or helping to feel better about taking that money if you're there to, you know, provide lunch and mm. and other support activities. Maybe. Judith wasn't at school very much, though, because she was usually off shooting a commercial or a show. In 1986, Judith was asked to audition for a role in the animated feature The Land Before Time. After her audition, director Don Bluth asked her if she'd like to play Ducky, and she replied, yep, yep, yep. He incorporated this line into her character, and it's one of the most quoted lines from the movie. It became a fan favorite. Her career was really picking up, and the more successful she became, the more Joseph turned the focus of his abuse onto her. One night, the Barsies had a little house party. They had some friends over. Everyone's having a good time. And of course, everyone is doting on Judith. First off, she's freaking adorable. Second, they're getting to see her on screen, which is really exciting. So they're probably like, we're so proud of you. Oh, you were so good in that show. Like things like that. Uh huh. And at one point, Judith gets up and goes into the kitchen. Joseph followed her. She had her hair in a ponytail and he just walked up to her. And yanked her ponytail so hard that she fell to the ground. Ooh, what? This is his daughter. But he was so jealous of the attention she was getting. Like, you would think he'd be proud of her and that he would love seeing how much people liked yeah. her. But but he just acted like a toddler throwing a tantrum. That is some deep dysfunction. I guess he felt a tinge of remorse because the very next day, as some sort of apology... He bought her a pink TV for her room. It was like, my bad. Here's the TV. Maria did her best to keep Judith out of the house as much as possible. When she wasn't on set or in school, they'd go to restaurants or visit friends. And whenever they were in public, Maria would only speak to Judith in Hungarian because she didn't want other people to know what she was saying. Judith was fluent in Hungarian. I'm not sure why Maria felt like she couldn't speak in English or shouldn't speak in English. It seems like she had a bit of paranoia, too. Both Joseph and Maria were very secretive mm -hmm. or private people. I don't know if it's a cultural thing or what, but there's that. For Judith's eighth birthday, so we're still in 1986, she had a party at a bowling alley with all her friends from school, but her dad wasn't there. And when one of the other parents asked about him, Maria very nonchalantly said, he's stuck at home getting drunk. That's quite a response. As Joseph drank more, the abuse at home increased. His threats were growing increasingly violent in nature. He often told Maria that if she and Judith tried to leave, he would burn the house down. He even kept a can of gasoline and would show it to her like, there it is. Don't think I won't do it. Dear God, get, get out. That's your, that's your cue. Get out. But when you're in that situation. Oh, yeah. You have no choice. You, you, what are you going to do? You can't. Well, I'm saying like you don't know what you would do unless you were in that situation. It's easy on the outside to be like, oh, obviously, like you got to you got to leave. It's different when you're when you're in it and it's not easy. Several sources stated that Joseph would alternate his threats to Maria. Sometimes he'd tell her he was going to kill her. Other times, he'd say he was going to kill himself and Judith so that she'd be left alone to suffer. This man is a monster. Yeah. Yeah, clearly some deep, deep psychological issues with him. Yeah. 
Judith confided in her best friend Trixie that her dad had gotten really drunk and thrown pots and pans at her head, and she ended up with a bloody nose. Then right before Christmas of that year, Maria filed a police report stating that for the last several years, Joseph had threatened to kill her, had hit her in the face, and had choked her. So Maria's going to authority. She's like, this is happening. We need help. But the officers saw, quote, no absolute signs of physical abuse. And they were like, "Mm, I don't see any bruises. You look all right to us. So reluctantly, Maria decided not to press charges because she knew that in the eyes of the police, she didn't have enough proof. This came up in our last case, the Amy Harwick case. Uh The system makes it incredibly difficult for victims of domestic abuse to get justice. Yeah, yeah. At the end of that year, Judith booked a role in the film Jaws the Revenge. This was a huge deal because it was her first major feature. It was to shoot in the Bahamas. And I'm sure if you're an eight-year-old kid and you find out you get to go to the Bahamas for two months with your mom and you can get away from your abusive dad, you're going to be elated. The night before they left, little Judith is in her room and she's got her suitcase open. She's getting all packed up. She's deciding which play clothes to bring, which bathing suits to bring. When Joseph walks into her room with a knife, he held the knife against her throat and said, quote, if you and your mother don't come back after the shooting, I'm going to cut your throat. What? To his young daughter. Good God. When they got to the Bahamas, Maria told anyone and everyone who would listen about the abuse going on at home, saying she feared for Judith's safety. But unfortunately, rather than being like, oh, let's get you some help, people just ignored her. Linda Stone Elster, who was Judith's teacher on set, said, quote, she was just constantly crying out, almost to the point where nobody took her seriously. It was like, oh, here goes Maria again, just worried about going home to this crazy person. Like, yeah, she was worried about going home to a crazy person. (laughs) Yeah. And I'm not saying that Linda is saying, oh, here goes Maria again. She was just trying to get across how Maria's cries for help fell on deaf ears. Yeah. But also it's like, well, you were there too, Linda. Joseph was really upset when his daughter left to go film. But when production offered him a plane ticket to fly him out, he turned it down. They were like, dude, we'll fly you for free to the Bahamas so you can see your baby girl. And he was like, nah. He didn't care about her. He was just jealous of her. Once production wrapped, Maria was like, let's not go home just yet. Let's go visit your uncle in New York. So the two went to stay with Maria's brother. When they didn't come home right away, Joseph got angry and had a suspicion they were probably staying with Maria's brother. So he called over there. Judith was playing with her cousin Eve when the phone rang. And Judith gets on the phone and her dad said, remember what I said before you left. Poor Judith bursts into tears. She drops the phone and runs out of the room, at which point Maria gets on the phone and goes off on him. And I wish it ended there and that I could tell you Maria and Judith never went back to California and they started a new life in New York. But that's not what happened. Oh, oh no. Instead, they cut their trip short. The very next day, they were on a flight back to L.A. Judith's demeanor changed drastically once she was back home from the Bahamas. Her agent, Ruth Hansen, noticed her mood change and said she was no longer the happy, bubbly little girl. Maria was very open about the the abuse they were receiving at home. Several people urged her to leave her husband, and Maria's response was varied. Sometimes she'd say she was considering a divorce. Other times she'd say she was scared to leave because he would find them. A friend offered to let her and Judith stay with them until they could find a more permanent solution, but Maria declined. She told people about his threats to burn down the house, and he'd done other things to prevent them from leaving as well. He hid their passports, for one thing. And one day, a telegram arrived to inform Maria that a close relative of hers had passed away in Hungary, but he threw it out so she wouldn't go. Whoa. A loved one calls Maria and asks, hey, did you get the telegram? Did you hear the news? And Maria's like, what telegram? So she confronts Joseph about it, and he pretended not to know anything about it. He was like, I don't know what you're talking about. Then later, he dug the telegram out of the trash and showed it to her, just as like a fuck you. He was all about control. 
Yeah, clearly. He was also really controlling about how the house looked. He was an obsessive neat freak. But he didn't clean it. He wasn't the one to do the cleaning. He expected Maria to. So Maria thought, maybe if I just stop cleaning, it'll encourage him to leave. Like, he'll get so fed up that he'll just peace out. So she stopped cleaning the house. Dirty clothes would pile up, toys would be left out, and Joseph got pissed. But rather than clean it up himself, he would invite friends over and give them tours of the house just to show them the mess and complain about Maria. Like, he didn't want to clean because to him, that was women's work. But he sure did complain about it a lot. That is bizarre. Friends of the Barcy said that Judith began to talk very darkly about her home life. She told them, quote, I am afraid to go home. My daddy is miserable. My daddy is drunk every day, and I know he wants to kill my mother. For that to even be a thought in a nine-year-old's head. Yeah. Later that year, 1987, Maria discovered that Joseph, old Arizona Joe, was having himself an affair. Of course. He bought his new girlfriend expensive gifts, a nice necklace, a ring. Mind you, he doesn't have the money on his own to buy these kinds of things. So this is his daughter's money he's spending on his new girlfriend. In December, Maria spoke with her niece about the affair, and she was not upset about it. Maria was not upset about it. It was just one more reason to get a divorce lawyer. She told her niece that his cheating was probably the best thing that had ever happened to her because she's thinking, this is my out. Yeah, that's a pretty clear out. The stress was really taking its toll on Judith. She gained a lot of weight in a short amount of time, and she began pulling out her eyelashes. She was also pulling out the whiskers of one of her cats. She was nine years old at the time. Pressure was also starting to build regarding Judith's height. She wasn't growing, and because she would soon be a preteen and be going out for older roles, it was unlikely she would get them because of her size, because... Hollywood is never happy with you. They loved her that she was small. Now they hate her that she's small. So come to find out, there was an issue with her pituitary gland, and she was sort of stuck at three feet, eight inches. Maria started taking her to UCLA to get growth hormone injections. So their fun trips out to restaurants and to see friends were a thing of the past. Now she had to go get these injections. That just sounds so difficult. In spite of everything... Judith's career is still going strong. She landed a dream role playing the younger version of Carol Seaver on Growing Pains, which she was so excited about because this was one of her favorite shows. Mm -hmm. She really bonded with Tracy Gold. Tracy, Tracy saw her as kind of a little sister. And Maria confided in Tracy about all of the abuse going on. And Tracy was like, oh, my God, please let me help you. But Maria declined. Instead, she came up with a plan that I'm sure to her in that situation in that time felt like the best option. In May of 1988, she rented an apartment in Panorama City, about a half hour drive from their house. She and Judith would essentially hide out there on days that Judith wasn't at school or on set. And then they'd go back home at night. Joseph didn't know about the apartment. And things went okay for a bit. Judith got the role of Anne Marie in All Dogs Go to Heaven, directed by Don Bluth, who had done The Land Before Time. The day came in filming where she was to record the song, Soon You'll Come Home. But right as she started to sing, she broke down sobbing. And this was unlike Judith. Judith was not a person who would just break down into tears. Yeah. She was crying so hard she couldn't speak. Her agent, Ruth, was with her in the studio and asked what's wrong. And Judith told her everything that was going on at home. It just came spilling out. Yeah, it just, just erupts. This obviously concerned Ruth. And she told Maria, you have to take this child to a psychiatrist. And she made her an appointment for one in Encino. After one session, the therapist called Ruth and told her there were extreme verbal, emotional, and mental problems and she was going to report it to Child Protective Services. Wow. So the L.A. Department of CPS gets involved. But they were completely overwhelmed with cases. Judith's caseworker had been assigned 67 cases at the time when 40 was considered a full caseload. Wow. 
A spokeswoman for CPS named Ray Lamott said that when they questioned Maria, Maria told them she had a plan of action. She'd rented this apartment, she felt safe, and she was going to divorce Joseph. So CPS was like, okay, cool, case closed. According to Judith's agent Ruth, Maria's account of children's services involvement went a bit differently. Ruth said that Maria told her, CPS isn't going to do anything, so I guess I have to handle it myself. That same month, Maria and Judith ran into Sherry and Andrea Barber in the parking lot outside of a studio. They would occasionally run into each other at auditions here and there. And the group started chatting. Summer was coming up and the majority of productions were going on hiatus. So things were about to slow down in the industry. And Sherry asked, does your family have any vacation plans? And Maria said, I want to take Judith to Hungary because she's never met my relatives. But if we go, I'm afraid my husband will burn down our house. Oh, my Lord. And Sherry kind of shook her head like, oh, what an ass. But then Maria said, he means it. So Sherry's thinking, is she being serious? Is she just letting off steam? Like, what is this? Then Maria leaned over to Sherry so that Andrea and Judith wouldn't hear her and whispered, he showed me where he keeps the gasoline can and told me how he intends to use it. He will do it. Sherry was at a loss for words. She just put her arm around Maria, but Maria looked away. And then they all said their goodbyes. But not before Sherry noticed that Judith had gained a considerable amount of weight and that she didn't have any eyelashes. Judith's agent, Ruth, kept urging Maria to leave Joseph. But Maria was hesitant. And she was probably terrified. Yeah. Maria said, I want to stay in the neighborhood long enough to celebrate Judith's birthday. I think she wanted her daughter to be around her friends and have a good time and probably didn't want to uproot her during that time. Yeah, yeah, that makes total sense. On June 6, 1988, Judith turned 10 years old. Double digits. That's a big deal for a little kid. (laughs) And Joseph had reached out to his other two children, Barna and Augie, asking them to come visit him. He wanted to make amends. By now, they were 29 and 30 years old. Barna agreed to go. Augie was a little hesitant because this is the man that had abused them and their mom. But she did want to meet little Judith. So they went. They actually got to celebrate Judith's birthday with her. Barna spent most of his time with Joseph, but Augie really bonded with Judith. And Judith loved it. She was so excited to have a big sister. And of course, Augie's just doting on her. But Augie could tell that something was off. She said when she looked at Judith, quote, I saw myself. We were the same person. And Augie knew right then that Judith was being abused. Oh, wow. There was a TV documentary about the Barcys that came out the following year called Fatal Passions. It's narrated by Patty Duke and several family members appear in it talking about this case, including Augie. Uh She said that she went to Maria and told her, you have got to take Judy and you have to leave. Go somewhere safe. But Maria wanted Joseph to be the one to leave. She said she had worked too hard on Judith's career and she shouldn't be the one that had to move out. I am not trying to victim blame here. These are the accounts given by those who were there. It's easy to sit here and be like, run! But again, I'm not in that situation and you don't know how you'd react until you're put in that situation. So Maria told Augie that that's why the house was so messy. She was trying to run Joseph out. Augie said of the mess, quote, It was disgusting. It was a pig's pen, a living pig's pen. There was stuff everywhere. It was like an episode of Hoarders. Maybe not to that extreme, but it was bad. And this is gut-wrenching. As Barna and Augie were loading up the car to head back to Arizona, Judith went running up to Augie and said, quote, Augie, take me with you. I'm scared that father is going to do something bad. Augie told her that everything was going to be okay. She said that their father had hurt her as a kid, but that it all turned out all right. This was only temporary. Oh, that's rough. Augie said, quote, I'll never forget the look in her eyes as we left. A few weeks later... Joseph decided to follow Maria one day. He was getting suspicious of where she was going all the time. And he followed her to the apartment in Panorama City and noticed her carrying a box inside. When he confronted her about it, she said she was just helping a friend move. But he wasn't buying it. 
On Friday, July 22, 1988, Maria spoke with Eunice Daly, who lived next door to the Barsies. She told her that she was thinking of filing for a divorce and moving into that apartment she'd been using. And Eunice was like, yes, do that. She had urged her several times to leave. But Maria was hesitant because she didn't want to give up the house. And she also told Eunice, I can't leave because he'll come after us and kill us. And he's threatened to burn the house down. Listen to Eunice. Listen to Eunice. But if you think that your husband will come after you and yeah. kill you, like she felt like she had nowhere. What what was her option? She felt like she didn't mm-hmm. have one. Yeah. Maria also mentioned that Judith's federal tax refund, which was a check for $12,000, had just arrived and she needed to go cash it before Joseph could get his hands on it. It's believed that she wanted to make sure she had this cash if she did move out because she needed some money to get by for a while. Three days later, on the morning of Monday, July 25th, Judith was seen riding her bike in the neighborhood. Sadly, this is the last time anyone outside of her home saw her alive. That evening, she put on her nightgown and crawled into her canopy bed rolled over onto her left side so she was facing the window that looked out into the backyard, and fell asleep. Her dad then walked into her room and shot her in the head just above her right ear, killing her instantly. Oh my God. Maria, who was also in bed, heard the gunshot and came running out. She knew what had just happened. She tried to run down the hall toward her daughter's room, but Joseph shot her in the head. She died immediately there in the hallway. Then for the next day and a half, he carried on as though nothing had happened. He stayed in the house with the corpses of his wife and 10-year-old daughter. Judith was supposed to be at Hanna-Barbera Productions for an appointment, but she didn't show up. When Ruth called the house to ask where's Judith, Joseph answered, which was already weird because Joseph didn't answer. Maria was the one who handled all of Judith's stuff. Uh Uh-huh. So Ruth's like, uh, where's Judith? What happened there? And Joseph said, oh, I saw a big car come pick them up and they took them to San Diego. Huh. Okay. He told her that he had decided to move out of the home for good, but he was just sticking around so he could say goodbye to his little girl. This didn't sit well with Ruth. So she called back later that Tuesday, but no one answered. Then Wednesday morning at around 830, Joseph carried a can of gasoline into his daughter's bedroom and poured it all over her body. He then did the same to Maria, and he lit a match. Then he went into the garage, and with the same 32 caliber pistol he used on his family members, he shot himself in the head. The neighbor, Eunice Daly, was outside watering her garden when she heard what she thought was an explosion. She then noticed smoke coming out from the roof of the house, and immediately she thought, he's done it, just like he said he would. She ran to call 911 while another neighbor, Michael Cutt, grabbed the watering hose that she'd been using and opened a sliding door in the back of the house, but there was too much smoke and he couldn't get through to fight the flames. Judith and Maria's bodies were burned beyond recognition, and the interior of the house was destroyed. When authorities found Joseph, the gas can was lying about four feet from his body and he still had the pistol in his hand. The bullet had gone through the garage door. So it was pretty clear what had happened, that this was a double Mm murder-suicide. There's a pretty well-known photo of an officer carrying Judith's body out of the house wrapped in a blanket. And two other officers are standing back near the front door crying. It is heartbreaking. Sherry Barber found out about the murders on the evening news. She was in shock. She said she broke down crying and could not breathe. She was really tormented. She couldn't sleep and she kept replaying her conversations with Maria in her head. And I think she felt a lot of guilt. So she ended up calling a local crisis helpline. Unfortunately, it sounds like the volunteer on the other end of the line either hadn't received proper training or was just ignorant to these situations but they blamed Maria. What? They told Sherry, quote, There's nothing you could have done. These women have no self-esteem and they go back to the man over and over again. And Sherry thought, these women, what the fuck? She'd always known Maria to be strong and capable. 
And the volunteer said, and this is even more horrible, they said, the only person who could have helped Maria was Maria herself. She knew her situation and how to alter it. Not all abusive men kill. What? Oh, okay. Oh, my good Lord. Horrible. That is egregious. I mean, that's just insult to major injury. Awful. The funerals for Maria and Judith were held a couple of weeks later on August 9th at Forest Lawn Memorial Park in L.A. Tracy Gold's family put the funeral together. Judith was buried in a small white casket. Lance Guest, who played her father in Jaws the Revenge, was one of her pallbearers. Sherry and Andrea Barber were both in attendance. Tracy Gold and her sister read eulogies. Tracy read the poem, A Child of Mine, by Edgar Albert Guest. I'm going to read the last few lines of it. It goes, We'll shelter her with tenderness. We'll love her while we may. And for the happiness we've known, forever grateful stay. But should the angels call for her much sooner than we've planned, we'll brave the bitter grief that comes and try to understand. Later that month, Juvenile Dependency Court Judge Catherine Doy Todd ordered the county to open the files of the Barcy case to the Commission for Children's Services. It was the first time in the Commission's or the Department of CPS's four-year history that a case had been ordered reopened. In reviewing the files, the Commission found that the reason the county had not taken action was because Judith's abuse had been emotional and they found no proof of physical abuse. Again, we've heard this in cases before. Uh huh. Helen Kleinberg, who was one of the members of this advisory panel, said, quote, This is part of the whole problem. It's easy to focus on physical abuse because we can see it. The panel recommended changes be made within the Department of CPS. In particular, they felt there should be clearer guidelines for closing a case. Robert Chaffee, the director of the department, appeared before the commission defending his agency, stating that Maria wanted the case closed. Sure, let's blame the victim here. Yeah, horrible. Kleinberg said that before a case can be closed, caseworkers should visit the home and or interview the child. She declined to say whether Judith had been interviewed, and Chaffee, the department director, said he could not recall. So that means no, they never spoke to Judith about what was going on at home. Cool, cool, cool. There's also no evidence that the department ever reached out to Joseph to check up on him. Chaffee blamed lack of funds for a lot of the department's shortcomings, but said the department was making changes to improve, including training employees on the safety of children in domestic violence situations, as well as requiring caseworkers to notify those with a legal obligation to report abuse, such as therapists, that a case is being closed. Judith's therapist was the one who reported the abuse to CPS, but she was never notified that the case was being closed. Judith's favorite role to play was the voice of Ducky in The Land Before Time. Sadly, she was killed before the movie was released, so she never got to see it. Oh, no. Oh. That was one of three projects that were released posthumously. The other two were an after-school special called A Family Again, and her final role, All Dogs Go to Heaven, which came out the following year. The song Love Survives from All Dogs Go to Heaven is dedicated to her. Oh, that is tragic. Oddly, Judith did not have a marker on her grave until 2004, 16 years after her death. What? Why did that happen? And her mom didn't get one until 2005. Yeah, it's weird. Fans of Judith created a fundraiser to get the markers. It's something that's brought up a lot with this case because with their connections and you know, the, the Gold family put the funeral together. It's like, yeah. why couldn't they have gotten markers? The only thing I could think is that maybe it was a situation where people assumed it was being taken care of. Like maybe the Gold family assumed Maria's brother would mm. handle that or something like that. I don't know. Yeah. But on Judith's grave are the words, yep, yep, yep. Her famous line from Land Before Time. Fast forward to 2016. It's the first season of Hollywood Medium with Tyler Henry. Matt, I know your thoughts on mediums. I, <laughs> You're a skeptic. I have strong thoughts on mediums. <laughs> very strong thoughts. I am very much a skeptic. But I do enjoy them. I like the show. I like those shows. I, it may be it may be all BS, but I enjoy the shows. Okay, okay. Uh, I've been on Tyler's wait list for years. Tyler, it's me, Kate. How about you give your girl a reading? 
Tracy Gold was on the show on the first season and Tyler gave her a reading and he first connects with her grandfather and tells her things that like she said no one else could have known. Then he connects with a woman who had passed from an eating disorder that Tracy was close to. And then he connects with a child. He says, this is a female child coming through. She acknowledges that she was not conscious when she passed away. And that was a relief to her because she wasn't aware of her passing. Tyler said, she's sweet. She's beautiful. She's lovely. And then he said, there's a reference to Joseph. Joseph, 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 Joseph. Like He just keeps saying it over and over again. Tyler starts fanning his face. He's like, I'm getting uncomfortable. And then he says, she was shot. And Tracy Gold was like, oh, my God, I know who you're talking about. Wow. And Tyler said, Joseph did this. Joseph did this. Joseph did this. And Tracy couldn't remember Judith's father's name. She's like, I, I don't know. Joseph might have been his name. Yeah, that kind of sounds familiar. I don't really remember. But Tyler just said, Joseph, Joseph. It was Joseph. It was Joseph. It's really, it's pretty creepy. Tyler said, quote, she's acknowledging her mother. She's not upset at her mother. She's acknowledging that the mother knew about the father and they wanted to get out of that situation. And then Tyler looks at Tracy and goes, was someone lit on fire? So Tracy tells him what happened and then asks, why would she come through when some of my own family members didn't? You know, like, why her? Yeah. And he said, I get a sense that there is a huge feeling of appreciation she wanted to express to you because they didn't really have anyone. And she appreciated that you put the funeral together and she appreciated the eulogy. It's wild. It's online if you want to check it out. Then in 2020, a show called Murder House Flip does an episode on the Barcy home. Really? Yeah. The family that was currently living in it felt really uncomfortable in the house. It had a bad energy, so they wanted a makeover. They'd actually tried to sell the home for years without any luck. The homeowners were Francisco Bernal, his wife, whose name I don't have in front of me, unfortunately, and their daughter, Gabby. They had moved in in 2001. Gabby was 10 years old at the time, the same age Judith was when she died. And Gabby's room had been Judith's room. The family said as soon as they moved in, they felt a dark presence. Weird stuff would happen. The garage door would open and close randomly. There were cold spots in the home. And they'd hear footsteps in the hallway when no one was in the hallway. And Gabby often felt like someone was standing in her bedroom doorway watching her. So they mentioned the weird stuff happening to a neighbor. And the neighbor was like, Well, you know what happened there, right? And that's how they found out about the murders. Oh, my Lord. Uh, Yeah, do maybe a touch more research before before you go to that closing. Well, it wasn't something that had to be disclosed. Yeah. Like property law or whatever. You don't have to tell someone they were murdered in that house. And prior to that, they didn't know anything about the home's history. Gabby's parents mentioned that from a really young age, Gabby had an imaginary friend. Like before they even moved into this house, Gabby had had this imaginary friend. She'd be alone in a room talking and they'd say, who are you talking to? And she'd say, I'm talking to Joseph. Dude. Whoa. Whoa. They gave the home a makeover, new paint, new lighting, rearranged furniture. It was a new house. One of the hosts of the show, Mikkel Welch, said of all the murder houses they'd flipped, this one was the heaviest. He said, I get chills thinking about it. But it sounds like Judith is okay wherever she is, and Maria too, I think. And according to Murder House Flip, it sounds like Joseph is probably tormented for all eternity in the afterlife. We can only hope. Today's lesson in horror would... When a woman tells you a man is going to kill her, believe her. Believe her. Oof. And that is the story of Judith Barcy. She's so cute. Thank you for telling it. I didn't know anything about her, and that's a, that's a harrowing story. Yeah, and the thing is, like, the way most people learn about her, or at least back in that time, was they saw Land Before Time. And they were like, oh, what's Ducky up to? Sure. And then that's how they would find yeah. out. Yeah. Oh, it's rough. 
I don't really know of a way to segue out of that. Yep. Yeah. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it helps us out a ton. You can follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. At Horwood Podcast. Or send us an email at horwoodpodcast at gmail.com. If you have any story ideas, like a case you want us to cover, let us know. We've gotten a few suggestions and keep them coming. We love it. And also, if you have your own tales, creepy tales, haunted tales, we want to hear them. It doesn't have to be related to Hollywood. We just want to hear from our listeners. I think we're going to start doing like a little Misfit Monday or something like that, where it's just all about you. So send us those stories. And if you're feeling so inclined and you want to hear more, you can jump on over to Patreon at patreon.com slash Horwood podcast. And like I said, we've got a new tier. It's a little cheaper. It's two bucks. You can be an accomplice and you don't get the bonus episodes, but you do get everything ad free. And then the tier next to that is $5 a month and that's a murderinos and you get all the stuff. Why not be a murderino? Why not be a murderino? Thank you, Matt, for being here. Uh, thank you for asking me. It was it was fun to be here. I don't know that it fun is how I would describe this, but I mean, maybe that's the wrong word, but <laughs> but uh, definitely um, definitely interesting to hear her story. Yeah, she was such a cutie, and um, Judith, wherever you are, I hope that you are riding your bike and climbing trees and watching growing pains and win, lose, or draw. Hope that's true. Yep. All right, till next time, Misfits.